But I'd like to tell you something about the pattern streamer that Technolution developed for mapper lithography. My name is Edwin Akenes. I'm with Technolution since 2003, and I've been, asked, been working with Mapper from 2004 till 2018. Before that, I received a PhD in computer architecture from Delft University of Technology. As a very small introduction, uh, I'll uh, show what a chip looks like on the inside. This is uh, valid for both uh, normal electrical chips as well as photonics chips. They're produced by putting layers on top of each other on a substrate. And each layer has a different composition and it has a different purpose, such as a gate or an interconnect. The process of making chips is shown in this image. Um, we start with a polished wafer and we go through an exposure cycle for 30 to 40 times. And finally, we separate and package the chips. In the exposure cycle, a, side, a layer of material is deposited on the entire surface of the wafer. And this layer is covered with a photoresistive coating. The photoresistive layer is exposed or not, which gives the definition of the chip. After developing the resist, the unwanted part of the full surface is etched away, leaving only the required features in place. As we all know, ASML is the world leader in tools for this exposure, a lithography step, and they sell their tools to almost any chip manufacturer in the world. Well, why would anyone want to change this process? Well, we always want smaller features, higher yields, higher throughputs, etc. Mapper lithography devised an alternative to the ASML tool, which would be cheaper and more flexible. Furthermore, due to the use of electrons instead of photons, the resolution would theoretically be much higher. Problem or disadvantage or advantage, electrons, unlike photons, cannot be controlled with a mask. So a new method of delivering the pattern to the wafer needed to be developed. This presentation will show you how we developed this pattern stream for the mapper tool. Remember when they made a nice animation video of the inner workings of their machine. What you see is a wafer moving under a stationary print head. The print head can be thought of as a needle printer, which moves over the paper and the needle shoots to the paper via an ink ribbon, placing some ink on the paper. On the blue wafer, you see black lines. These indicate the various fields or chips that are printed on the wafer. Each field can consist of multiple smaller chips. As we move into the next viewpoint, the internals of the print head become visible. On the top, you see the green electrons being generated, just like in an old television. The electron beam is split into 13,000 individual beams. From both sides, the red optical fibers from the pattern streamer enter the print head. Each optical fiber meets its own E-beam at the blanker. The optical signal controls the E-beam. It switches the beam on and off. This is achieved by bending the beam a little using a capacitor and a stop array. Below the blanker, all beams are collectively deflected over three micrometer. Each beam writes a strip of two micrometers with some overlap. Here you see about 20 of those beams working together. They, in the, if the E-beam is on, the resist is turning blue, otherwise it remains white. The wafer is moving steadily under the print head. This mechanical scan ensures we can write the entire length of the wafer, all 300 millimeters. This is what it looks like below the deflection array. In this animation, the fields written are just the mapper logo. As 13,000 stripes of two micron are printed in parallel, we can print the usual 26 millimeter wide fields. And once a complete stripe of fields is written, the wafer is repositioned for the next stripe. This next stripe is written in the opposite direction, which is one of the many details I will leave out of this presentation.
So the working of a mapper tool resembles that of a matrix printer. My very first, first printer in 1985 was a star LC10 printer, which had the following styles. As you can see from the draft line of the examples, a dot matrix printer just puts small dots of ink on a page. It uses only nine bins to do so. The mapper tool can be thought of as a 13,000 beam matrix printer. So if you would print uh, the data going to the uh, to this uh, blanker, just like a normal laser printer on 600 dpi, we would be printing 80,000 pages per second. That is 400 kilogram or 200 kilograms of paper if you print double-sided, but that's per second. So that gives you an idea of the amount of data that we are going to process. Why is it that much, why is it that much data? Well, we aimed for the standard 300 millimeter wafer and a two, 22 millimeter features, which gives a two nanometer overlay contribution maximum for the data path. How can we, can we achieve this uh, accuracy with e-beams that we can only switch on and off? Well, we can achieve that by using a three nanometer binary pixel. If we divide these numbers, we see that we have 100 million pixels across a wafer, 100 megapixels. That seems doable, but we need, <coughs> we need this resolution in the other direction as well. So we end up with uh, 100 million squared or 10 quadrillion pixels per wafer, 10 petapixels. To put this into perspective, on the surface of the Earth, which is 510 million square kilometers, we can only fit 36 trillion wafers. So if you make a pixel, a wafer out of each pixel, we would have to stack these 200 tick when spreading them out over the entire Earth. The e-beams uh, of the mapper tool can only exist in vacuum. You see that on the right, the vacuum uh, vessel of the uh, mapper tool. And the uh, computer will, which will compute these pixels will approximately take one 19 inch, 19 inch uh, rack. How can we transfer this, this amount of data to the vacuum uh, vessel, which is about 30 meters further away? And how can we connect these hundreds of signals to the blanker which is only a three by three centimeter chip. Well, as you imagine, we are at the Photonics Conference. The only way to do that is by an optical fiber array. The image manipulation that we are going to do on the, uh, on the uh, layout that we are going to print is needed because the machine itself has some imperfections, but also the wafer the, field, the previous fields on the wafer are not exactly at the positions we want them to be. So we do a, a, a lot of uh, manipulations and the left half of that is done uh, uh, non-real time and the right half is done real time. We start off with the vector format, which is in almost infinite position accuracy, and it is rendered to a five nanometer grid. This five nanometer grid you see in image two as pixels which are fully off, pixels which are fully on, and pixels which are on the boundary. The pixels that are on the boundary are given a gray level de depending on how much overlap there is. And these gray levels are uh, dithered to 16 different gray, gray levels. The output of this is still independent of the machine constants in the previous layer. It is compressed and stored on hard disks. Up to this point, everything is non-real time. From here, it starts to be real time. This pattern is uploaded to the pattern streamer, which is an FPGA-based uh, PCB. Which, and uh, in that pattern streamer, we store it into uh, DDR3 RAM. Each FPGA takes five beams, so it receives five different files. The software spans a new grid on top of the five nanometer grid, and this time the grid is three nanometers. All four corners of that grid are a little flexible, which means that we can correct for all kinds of imperfections in the previous line uh, layers. Using this new span, we determine for each of the pixels what their new position is and how they contribute, what, what gray level they have. The final step is the dittering, where 
Every pixel is rounded to either zero or one, but as no, those may, uh, uh, may be, go uh, unused, we have to make sure that all the errors that we make are uh, uh, spread over the neighbors that are still to be uh, processed. We use Floyd Steinberg dittering for that, which is an uh, industry standard uh, used for uh, optical, uh, for, for image uh, processing. This is the PSC60, the, the, uh, the workhorse of the machine, which processes these uh, pixels. This card can uh, do that for 60 of the channels that, uh, 16, 60 of the 13,000 channels that we were talking about. So we need a lot of these FPGAs. Um, for the first machine mapper made, the, which was only a one way per hour machine, we could still fit everything in one 19 inch cabinet. Together with the hard disks storing the data. The intermediate is the fiber optics. The fiber optics are used to bring the data from the 19 inch cabinet into the vacuum. We still use standard MPO 12 connectors on the petrol streamer side and a dedicated fiber assembly on the blanker side. As the blanker operates in vacuum, the vacuum, a vacuum feed through is also part of this halfway. Finally, the most important part, the blanker. The blanker is uh, taking care of switching the beams on and off. In this image, you see the red squares, which are individual photodiodes. These are flip chipped on a CMOS chip because the entire uh, Blanker is a CMOS chip and the photodiodes are made of a different material. Flip chipping uh, uh, 800 photodiodes on the chip is kind of difficult. So that's something to, where we can improve. The E-beams are organized in the middle of this. And, and you see that into some, uh, some detail here. Each, each of these holes is basically one capacitor which we can control with a voltage. And if the voltage is on, the beam is slightly tilted and the pixel is switched off. Or if, and if the pixel is, uh, the capacitor is off, then the, the electron flies through it and the pixel will be on. Future improvements. Well, we, uh, we generated this system and it worked uh, uh, okay, but we would like to make it more stable and uh, also um, more cost-effective. Altera introduced these uh, optical FPGAs uh, some years ago, but unfortunately we didn't see them uh, other than uh, in uh, presentations. You might recognize the micropod in this uh, array. And what you see here is this just that they uh, mounted the micropods for an RX and a TX 12 volt on the same substrate as the FPGA. For this, in the same holds for the photodiodes on the CMOS chip, the, the blanker. We would really like them to be integrated on the real, uh, on the blanker chip itself, because that gives less integration steps and higher yields. Finally, I'd like to do some suggestions on how the uh, photonics community could speed up the adoption of photonics. In my opinion, we used FPGAs as the main building blocks for this uh, re functionality, together with standard components as DRAM and optical transmitters. These FPGAs are very regular. They have no predetermined task. They, have, they are very flexible for the user. That also means that they are very easy testable and they are mostly on the edge of the foundry's capabilities. And that might seem a contradiction, but the foundries actually want them to be on the edge as they use FPGAs to fine tune their processes. If delays on the outer edge of an FPGA or the outer edge of a wafer different from the delays on the inner edge of the FPGA or the wafer, then that's something they have to correct for in their processing. So FPGAs give a lot of flexibility in what they can reveal about the actual processing going on in the wafer. Fab. For the user, this means that we have access to high-speed processes 
without the drawbacks of producing our own chips, which is a costly and also time consuming uh, uh, endeavor. These uh, benefits could also be brought to the photonics world. I would suggest designing a field programmable photonics array, which can be programmed using normal IC technology. Such an FPPA would allow users to experiment with the technology at moderate cost and also allow foundries to fully test the design as well as the process. And I hope you will be as successful as Science and Altera were with their FPGAs. That brings me to the end of my presentation. I left out quite a number of details, but I still hope you have a basic understanding of the technology and how we process such an enormous amount of data. I'd be happy to take any questions right now. And if you wish, feel free to contact me by mail.